امم <تصفيق> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته on behalf of the organizing and scientific committee for this activity i would like to uh, welcome you all to our uh, activity it will be uh, uh, talking about uh, management of upper airway in uh, pediatric uh, population um, we have a, a local national uh, uh, <clears throat> military hospital um, uh, I would like to present myself first. I'm Mohammed Al Faifi, pediatric emergency consultant, associate professor uh, at uh, Al Faisal University, College of Medicine. And uh, my colleagues, we have uh, Dr. Salih Al Shihri, we have Dr. Hamad Al Madi, we have Dr. Faiz Al Harithi, and uh, Dr. Maher Al Kuwaiti. Also, we have our uh, colleagues uh, will join us. Uh, Mr. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Ibrahim Khalid. Uh, I think we should start now. Uh, our first topic will be presented by Dr. Uh, Salih Al Shihri, who is a pediatric emergency consultant. He is the chairman of uh, Department of Emergency Medicine at uh, Prince Sultan uh, Medical Military uh, City in Riyadh. Uh, Dr. Salih Al Shihri, he uh, uh, did his uh, fellowship training sick at uh, Toronto Children Hospital, and he did also uh, MBA uh, in health administration as well as uh, a leadership certificate. Uh, Dr. Salih Shihri will talk uh, in uh, <clears throat> about the anatomy of uh, airway in children compared to adult, and also he will. Uh, talk about the indication of uh, intubation in the pediatric population. Uh, Dr. Saleh, I hope he is ready now.
الانبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه ومن والاه الى يوم الدين اتس ماي بليشر تو ستارت ذس ذا تيريال اوف سيركشرز اباوت ذا اير واي از ماي ريكشرز شود بي بيس اون ذا اير واي مانجمنت اناتومي So we'll go back to the medical school and we'll speak about a little bit about uh, the airway anatomy in kids. Uh, inshallah, also I'm done with, uh, after that, to compare it with uh, pediatrics and adult. And shortly at the end of the lectures, we'll talk about uh, the indication of intubations. Bismillah uh, rahim So the airway anatomy in kids is simple. Uh, let's talk about it. It starts from As you know, from the nose, from the external nares here, as you see here, uh, which is progress until we reach the trachea. So this is the airway management that's important uh, things in the pediatric that we need to manage it urgently uh, in emergency and make sure to be secure. <clears throat> so start from external nares. It includes also the nose. Uh, also, as you see me, I'm sniffing, so I'm including the paranasal uh, sinuses. Uh, also, uh, it's including also the pharynx, uh, which is also a site of uh, traffic here. We'll talk a little bit about it, and we will go to the larynx until we reach to the trachea. So, uh, and uh, if I go here, tell me please. So uh, the nose here is originated from the cranial ectoderm, uh, and uh, the external nose here is made from, you know, the nasal bone and the cartilage, uh, 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 the, the nasal part of the frontal bones also, and also the frontal process of the maxilla. Uh, when you look inside the nasal, uh, nasal capital here, uh, will be divided to the nasal septum, so it will divide the nasal to the right and left. And uh, also to separate that, uh, it will be uh, also uh, open to the external side, what we call it, nearest. When we look to the back here, what we call it is conal or nasal apertures. And we know that this is a common site, what we call it is conal atresia. When some kids born at birth uh, and they cannot uh, breathe from the nose, so they we call it conal atresia. Uh, the other one here, we, we, uh, there's an area here is interesting here, what we call it the fibula, which is the second place in the body after the liver, which is including the anastomosis, arterial anastomosis here. Uh, it's called little area. A little area here, it's a common area for bleeding or epistaxis. Uh, when we examine any patient who's having epistaxis, this is a common area because it's weak, fragile. And it's an osmosis between the arteries. So that's area called Little's area. Uh, it's a common site for epistaxis. <clears throat> uh, each side of the nose has a roof, uh, floor, uh, and medial, and uh, the roof and the lateral wall. It's like a room from four directions. Uh, and children here, uh, uh, the, the The smaller size of, uh, of the uh, nose are easily being obstructed. So when we look here, this area, kids having small nose and also the kids, they cannot breathe from the mouth until being trained after the uh, age of six months or one year. So this is a common area being obstructed, especially in case of upper respiratory tract infections and especially in the bronchitis. So <clears throat> uh, This area, when obstructed, sometimes the kids may be struggling with breathing and he having respiratory problems and he may get cyanosis because the kids, they cannot breathe from the nose, from the mouth. They can only breathe from the nose. So this is a common area of obstructions and complications in the kids and we need to be careful uh, about it. Uh, Let us talk about the paranasal sinus. Did the kids born with the sinus? Yes, there is two area being, there is two sinuses. Kids be born with it, it's ethmoidal area here, and the maxillary, what you can hear small, it's present from the birth. And then will be after age of five to six years, it will be able to have a frontal sinus. Then 
and we have frontal and saphenoid sciences, which is uh, started after uh, childhood or in the, the beginning of adulthood. Uh, uh, sinusitis here, it can happen to the kids here. It's a common uh, site of the uh, airway obstruction uh, to the air. We need to keep up it because it's half frequent and uh, uh, copper secretions coming from the sinus and sign obstructions. Uh, also, this area is a common for uh, to be signs of fictions, what we call sinusitis, being complicated to cellulitis and abscess formation. Let's talk here about the second area, which is from started from here. What we call it here is called pharynx. Pharynx is divided to the <coughs> three areas: nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. Uh, the pharynx form here of the common upper pathway of the respiratory and the mental tract. Uh, actually, it's organizing uh, between the air and uh, the food, uh, so it's like a traffic area here. It's a free communication between nasal cavity and the mouth <coughs> and larynx. Let's talk about a little bit about the nasopharynx here. Nasopharynx here, it's you can see it here. It's like immediately uh, behind the nasal cavity and it's above the soft uh, palate. Uh, uh, it's communicated between the oropharynx and the pharyngeal isthmus. Uh, uh, it's been closed usually because when the food, so it can prevent food from coming up to the nose. <clears throat> the sinusoidal innervation here is derived from the trigeminal nerve and the nerve. Uh, the, during development here, the depth of nasopharynx increase as a result of remolding the palate, as well as the change of the angulation of the skull of the face. So you're expecting to with a childhood, it's, getting, it's small and when uh, during with, with the age progress, it's getting bigger. <clears throat> uh, we'll talk about here about uh, the nasopharynx. Also, it's the pharyngeal opening of the pharyngeal tympanic. Here, what we call here is is the station the tubes, which is the opening between the nasopharynx and the ear. So it's maintaining the pressure of the ear here. It's in, uh, present in the in the lateral uh, wall of the nasopharynx. Uh, nasopharynx uh, tonsils here, uh, where it's called adenoid. So be careful uh, when you examine the kids, uh, if it's getting big and make obstructions, uh, it needs to be diagnosed earlier. Uh, uh, also be careful when we insert any instrument here, uh, nasal tubes or whatever. Uh, so this can be easily uh, dislodged uh, down and come aside also for bleeding. Uh, it's a, Site when it's getting bigger or uh, large or inflamed, it's called adenoid hypertrophy. <coughs> oropharynx. It's oropharynx here. It's oropharynx here extends from the soft palate, uh, from the soft palate uh, 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 to the tips of the deglutis. Uh, it's attached anteriorly to the base of the tongue. Uh, actually, what are you getting here? When I see here, I see half of the slide. So I have difficulty following the slide here. So let's go back to my the lectures here. It's attached anteriorly to the base of the tongue via the gloss of the protic fold. Between this fold, there's a, a, a periculi. The sensory here innervation of the oropharynx is coming from the glossopharyngeal nerves and the superior laryngeal ringle of the vagal nerves. So this also common area, this is one of the areas being uh, supplied by the vagal nerves. And if you have a lot of manipulation in this area, uh, the patient can get to the uh, bradycardia and the hypertension. So be careful when you manipulate this area. Uh, the oropharynx here is a reflex of the secretory response to the direct laryngoscope and tracheal intubations, resulting largely from stimulation of the pharyngeal wall and the laryngoscope of the leg. Uh, uh, as we mentioned here, uh, uh, as we see it here, uh, it's a small additional response is produced by the passage of endotracheal tube through the portal cord. Uh, it's an area here is a present of uh, uh, multiple lymph nodes, what we call Walter's ring. Uh, it consists of lingual tonsils at the base of the tongue and bilateral, what we call the tonsils in the throat. We call it, what we call it bilateral palatine tonsils. 
Uh, this is a well based uh, uh, ring that consists from palatine tonsils here and lingual uh, tonsils here. <clears throat> so we are expecting in the oropharynx because this is area in case it's, we are getting a lot of challenges here. And this is area common being obstructed. And also when we want to secure the airway, also there is a challenge here and we may face difficulties compared by the adults. Uh, first, the inflammation of the lymph tissues here, it may be obstructed breathing. You may start by snoring, you may start then by striders <coughs> uh, until uh, with severe uh, distress, you can be completely obstructed. Uh, gender here and ethnics here being the contributes to the space of the oropharynx uh, and together with the relation of the oropharynx dimension and sleep sort of breathing. The relative large tongue here also, it, it makes the space here is a little bit compromised uh, the, the airway here. Uh, another challenge here is, uh, is decreasing the muscle tone here. The muscle tone is contributed to the passive obstruction airway. Uh, infant, as we see in the pictures here, in the getting supine, because of the large uh, occipital areas here, you may have to make care of the airway and you may expect more obstructions. So uh, uh, the tank is getting flat against the plate, inspirator, and maybe remain the positions, passive inspirations. So we need to do some, um, uh, uh, if we get some, and uh, 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 here under the, 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 the neck. So to get more open the airway and to facilitate the intubations. So you need to care more the, uh, the, the cervical spines. Uh, if the patient, of course, had no trauma, uh, this may be improving the, the passages of the airway. <clears throat> the range of pharynx. Uh, the range of pharynx here is extended from the tip of the epiglottis to the lower of the border of the pre-coil cartilage. Uh, it's, uh, the larynx is bounding back in the center of the larynx of pharynx and in the recess of either side. <coughs> this is, sorry, this is a periformed uh, uh, fossa, which is a common site that uh, many foreign bodies can be obstructed at this area. We we'll go to the larynx. Larynx, I call it the traffic area. <coughs> The lynx is situated between the pharynx and the trachea, from both of that. Uh, it's extending from the base of the tongue uh, until the trichoid cartilage, which is the only complete ring in the airway systems, it's a trichoid cartilage. <clears throat> uh, you know the our sounds, uh, uh, and uh, it's coming from the larynx, and it's a common sign that to protect our life uh, from disrupting the foods, fluids, uh, waters, whatever to the trachea, uh, uh, the trachea bronchial trees here. So good protection uh, and during the swallowing and also during the cover. <clears throat> uh, this is what we can see here, the, the diagrams here, uh, the, uh, which is a cartilage composed of the larynx. The big one is the thyroid uh, cartilage, which is two pairs of two cartilage, we call it arytenoids, uh, uh, and to, uh, together uh, make uh, cuneiform cartilage. Uh, this is the largest uh, uh, cartilage in the, in the larynx area. It's open, uh, posterior, it's like rings. So it's, it's over from here, so to, to go from the larynx. Uh, from the anterior side, uh, what we have in the males, it's Adam's apple. <clears throat> Beneath the thyroid cartilage is the trichoid cartilage, which is a complete rings. Uh, covering uh, the whole larynx. Uh, the only is completing the cartilage ring from the best part of the ground. <clears throat> At birth, uh, you can see that uh, the lower border of the trichoid cartilage lies opposite to the uh, opposite uh, to the fourth cervical vertebra. When the child grow and reach to six, six years of age, uh, it reached up to a level of fifth cervical. <clears throat> vertebra. When we reach to the adult side, the trichoid is to the six uh, cervical vertebra. The small size of the, the trichoid children here in children uh, is 
maybe uh, make a challenge uh, during the intubations because we need to manipulate the airway there. It's an area of visit of mucosal, which is can be uh, uh, getting edema and swelling and compromising the airway there <clears throat> with any infections or allergies. There. So it's, 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 it's a dangerous area too. We need to be keep high attention to this area. It's uh, actually uh, it's, uh, getting obstructed much, much faster than uh, the adult. <clears throat> We're still in the uh, larynx area. Uh, we'll talk about, about the tricoid, uh, tricothyroid membrane, which is uh, here is a, is a tough uh, uh, elastic connective for tissues here. Uh, it's uh, rounded the whole larynx here. Uh, this area is, uh, is, uh, is a site of surgical airway when anything above the focal cord <clears throat> uh, or above the epiglottis is getting obstructed. So this area can be opened to easily access the airway from, uh, from down uh, and uh, secure the life and save the life. Uh, epiglottis, epiglottis here. Uh, anyone working in anesthesia, pediatric emergency, pediatric emergency, emergency area or critical area, the all uh, we are always complaining about this area because it's floppy, uh, it's uh, uh, it's difficult to catch. It's it's important to open it to get the screw in the airway. So anyone working in this area, we're always complaining about this. The epiglottis. Uh, uh, it's leaf shaped structures attached to the cereal to the border to the thyroid cartilage. Uh, and the adult epiglottis is broad, uh, and the kids, it's small. Uh, it's more firm in adult, in kids, more floppy, and they, they can, you can, you, it's, it's difficult to catch it. <coughs> uh, and the infant, it's narrow, and the adult, as we said, is, is broad. Uh, an infant or children is soft and more horizontal uh, positions, and that's why we like to use the straight uh, gyroscope, uh, not the curve. Uh, the threat, uh, the nigroscope here, blade is to facilitate lifting the epiglottis because our, um, we, we are all, our challenge when we go inside the airway with the epiglottis. Uh, so we prefer to use the straight nigroscope. And the adult, uh, and the adult or all the children, uh, we can use the curve one because you can go behind the epiglottis <clears throat> and easily elevate it and you go inside. The good things with the curve that you can avoid manipulate with the uh, vagal nerve. So less complication with bradycardia and uh, hypertension. The nerve here is supplying the larynx is from the vagal nerve, which is a dangerous nerve. Be careful about it. Uh, we don't like to play a lot with this nerve. Uh, uh, the superior laryngeal nerve gives rise of the internal laryngeal branch with the transpenate and mucosa and the periforms fossa. Uh, here at this position, it can be blocked by the typical anesthesia, <clears throat> either spray or uh, or like uh, some uh, lidocaine specialized for intubations, this area. So you're getting less complications during the intubation. It's more used with elective intubation rather than emergency intubations. Uh, laryngeal and uh, and the inferior surface of the glottis is innervated by the vagal nerve. So, Here's the important thing is when the epiglottis is left with a straight laryngoscope blade, you're expected to have bradycardia, hypotensions. So we are being reluctant to use the atropine uh, when we use it before or when we intubate the kids because we are using the straight laryngoscope. The laryngoscope is uh, more, having more complication because more manipulation with, with the vagal nerve. Care blade is used because it's been used behind the epiglottis uh, as angulated, so it's within to have this, uh, this complication than this rate. Uh, the problems with this box, uh, with the larynx, when we play to securing the airway, it's highly compliant and the more carotidal support. It's less than developmental than adult, it's less firm. So uh, you're expecting some movement, a lot of movement in the, in the wall of the airway. Uh, it's literally increased the speed of the dynamic airway collapse. Uh, and the presence of the airway obstructions. Uh, easily being uh, lose the airway uh, pathway, especially with non-expert uh, people when they do intubating the, the kids. Uh, and the adults more, more clear and more firm and like, uh, like a hard box, you can go.
<coughs> and kids also, we, uh, the, the muscle tone is uh, loose, so easily be collapsed, obstructive of, uh, at the level of soft palate and the epiglottis. Uh, laryngeal malaysia, which is uh, some of uh, 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 problems with some kids, which is uh, immature cartilage here, and uh, you may hear a, a lot of uh, snoring sounds uh, during the expiratory and expiratory sounds. more soft and more musical sounds. Uh, many kids the, with the age will be getting improving the energy of Malaysia and we can develop uh, more cartilage. Uh, here is, uh, we'll talk about uh, indication of uh, intubation for children. We summarize it and go more details because uh, there is no time. Uh, the main indications for intubation kids are securing the airway when the kids came with um, either severe asthma, <clears throat> severe pneumonia, uh, severe distress, acute respiratory distress, pneumonia, whatever, when be more uh, uh, seeing the oxygen saturations is getting less than 60 in the blood gas, or, or the, the child is using high flow oxygen and still the child is uh, still desatting, uh, using more than five liters, their minutes oxygen, and still the child need more uh, oxygen. Uh, uh, the present of uh, bipap or nasal CPAP, uh, so we need to secure the airway uh, to prevent the desatin and catast catastrophic issues after that. Severe hyperventilation from the bronchitis, especially the the, the uh, increased secretions of uh, mucosas here. Uh, when we, the child is start to build up uh, uh, carbon dioxide, more than 50 with severe distress, so expect to have collapse and respiratory failures. And uh, here the airway, earlier there. <clears throat> uh, also one of the indication of intubation, even there is um, a lot of precautions use it uh, use it because uh, once you intubate those type of kids you'll be having a hard time to excavate them and maybe it's difficult or it's impossible to, to excavate them like children who have in primary neuromuscular uh, disorders one of them like sma they already uh, signed as dna so to avoid intubating uh, other indication for uh, neuromuscular because child present with decreased mental status Decrease GCS more less than six. Uh, start with, uh, having hyperventilation like uh, trauma brain injuries or intoxications, uh, whatever, so that affect the brain and uh, the, the brain stem uh, from doing the, the, their jobs to, to ventilate uh, the child themselves. So here we need to 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 the shells externally. Uh, also. Uh, Lack of airway uh, protections uh, like the um, uh, traumatic brain injury with uh, low DCS, uh, severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, also intoxications. Uh, if the child needs sedation, the and that sedation will uh, affect the respiratory, uh, affect for that, and the airway protections. So here we need to, uh, you need to, to secure the airway. <coughs> Uh, we need to also to uh, control the carbon dioxide, uh, like uh, kids with uh, increasing intracranial pressures. So you need to control the carbon dioxide between 25 and 30. So uh, you need to manage that one. Uh, so you need to be uh, secure their way. Uh, severe pulmonary hypertension. Uh, uh, also, one of the indications, and uh, many of the decisions, maybe they are not highly aware about it, about to reduce uh, when they or shock. So you need to decrease the muscle work and save the energy for the kids and reduce the metabolic demands here. So you need to secure their way and relax the uh, respiratory muscle. Respiratory muscle, unfortunately, is one of the major muscles that using uh, calories in the kids. So you need to switch it off and save the energy for other organs here. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm willing to see that question. Thanks a lot.
thank you very much, Dr. Saleh, for this. Um, as uh, for our uh, participant and audience, please, uh, there is uh, an icon for questions and answers. And I noticed most of you were asking questions regarding the CME hours, how many CME hours for this uh, uh, activity? It is five hours. And the email that you already entered in Momaris, uh, it will uh, automatically go uh, to uh, your uh, CME hours. Uh, it will be considered up to 10.30. Hopefully we'll finish before 10.30. It is only one day activity because I uh, get uh, most of your question regarding this. There is one question only for you, Dr. Saleh. One of the uh, participants, he was asking, what is the importance of uh, sinuses in the management of uh, airway? Like okay. maybe a chronic sinusitis, whatever it is. So is there any? Okay, go ahead. Uh, the importance of the sinus here, uh, it's maybe not direct to the airway management or so securing the airway. When having uh, bronchitis, they may have upper airway obstruction because of the, a lot of secretions coming from the sinus. As we know, only the kids or, or the infant be having only uh, two sinus coming from the uh, ethmoid and the maxillary sinus, which is a site of uh, common for uh, for uh, for secretions here. So. Uh, when you, uh, the kids, they may present with severe distress, and the only thing that you need to manage is only remove that secretion from the upper airway from the nose, and that's it. And the Thank you very much, Dr. Saleh, for this interesting talk, and wish we will see you again in our future courses and activities. Thank you very much. Uh, our uh, next uh, speaker is... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Dr. Faisal Harthi. Dr. Faisal Harthi, he is uh, a pediatric emergency and trauma consultant. Uh, he is a program director for pediatric emergency fellowship program, head of pediatric emergency scientific committee uh, at uh, Prince Hospital. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Faisal Harthi, he graduated from, uh, he did his fellowship program in uh, <clears throat> British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada. And uh, he did also a pediat uh, fellowship uh, program in pediatric trauma. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Uh, uh, Faiz will talk about the assessment of difficult airway in pediatric uh, uh, patients presented in the emergency department. Dr. Uh, Faiz. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Muhammad. Uh, I tried my best to keep this uh, talk uh, simple, short. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, assessment for difficult airway in, in pediatric. Is it clear the voice? Now it's clear. Just a few seconds ago, your voice were lost, but now it is clear. You can uh, go ahead. Okay. So we'll talk about uh, assessment. I believe this uh, uh, academic night and involving uh, too many people from different specialties, especially from nurses, paramedics, uh, students. So we'll keep it uh, complete all. So uh, if, you know, if, you, if you know that airway is the most important critical element in patient safety and difficult intubation commonly cause morbidity and mortality. So we'll try to find a simple, uh, accurate approach to do this assessment. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, 332 roles. We'll talk about mal and bati. We'll talk about how to evaluate obstructive airway. And then we'll try to uh, summarize this in early complete airway assessment. If you are, if you are going to do an intubation in ER, uh, it's, uh, this is some example why you need to do intubation. Uh, one is complicated procedure sedation. So patient coming with the fracture, and then you decide to do procedure sedation. Uh, things went badly, and the patient need intubation. 
other 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 uh, other indication is pending respiratory failure, shock, cardiac arrest, trauma. Why I am mentioning this? Because of it's already stress uh, uh, to start first with decision of intubation. Uh, decision of intubation is not easy uh, decision. Uh, and usually, as, as I mentioned in the previous examples, uh, uh, one of the complicated procedure sedation or patient coming with shock or trauma, already the patient has primary, a primary disease or primary uh, condition that you need to deal with it. And you add to this stress, you decide for intubation. Uh, so this is make it a huge decision. Uh, and other, other, uh, himself, it's, it's not easy uh, patient to do intubation. Uh, we'll add the family around you. Uh, this uh, make it very serious condition. And worsening the current condition. What I mean, like patient coming with head trauma or patient shock, you need to deal with these primary things. But when you add decision of intubation, then you need to deal with another problem, especially if things will, will, uh, will go uh, badly. <clears throat> okay. Dr. Salah Shiri, he, he mentioned about the anatomy. But when you do the patient, you will not, it's not like this, he says, you'll see it very clear, the tongue, the epiglottis, the vocal cord. This is just as anatomy to know. What you see in emergency is this, okay? You'll see, uh, uh, you'll see this kid, uh, he's connected to the oxygen. And uh, you, you, if you notice the mouth, uh, opening mouth, this is the small area that you need to deal with it. It's your entrance to the airway. It's cannot deal with, I mean, deal with, uh, with, with, the, with the intubation, with complication with this small area, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's bad time. And then from this small mouth, you need to go far away to reach to the focal cords. But there is dark tunnel, there is a, a big anatomy called tongue. So it's not easy, uh, it's not very clear area to deal with it. So what I mean by triple A, triple A, I mean accurate airway assessment. Informative, accurate assessment to do with this airway because there is no much chance to do mistake. You need to deal with the patient with 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 his primary presentation, or which is sometimes it's not uh, nothing to do with, with intuition. Intuition you will do it as complication or as a help for his primary disease. So as uh, as we I mentioned always, history is the goal for any management, uh, but uh, we need to be focused. And then we'll go to the standard exam and special exam. By the history, what I mean, it's we'll go by, by any symptoms of upper respiratory tract infection. Uh, this it will it will make the area inflamed and easy and, and difficult for intubation. Desatting, during anesthesia, snoring, this we need to think about adenoid hyperotrophy, chronic cup, we need to uh, think about subglottic stenosis, productive cup, we need to think about. Uh, bronchitis and pneumonia, sudden or new cup or inspiratory strider, you need to think about foreign body and horse horse, laryngitis and epiglottitis. Asthma, asthma, repeated pneumonia, you need to think about uh, gastrointestinal flux disease, history of any foreign body respiration, any briefest problem with anesthesia, atopy, and uh, also the most important history of congenital syndrome, very robin syndrome, trachea. Uh, syndrome, Down syndrome, coronal atresia, and smoker. And then exam, the standard exam, you need to look for signs of distress, like increase of work breathing, tachypnea, tachycardia, and is noses, grunting, wheezing. All this make, make, make the, 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 the intubation is difficult, use of accessory muscle, altered consciousness, like any trauma or drug overdose, inability to lie down, so we are uh, using a special maneuver called LEMON, L-E-M-O-N, -L and we'll go uh, in, uh, in details in each one. So this LEMON is a very famous uh, uh, approach. Okay, L, it's uh, externally. This is very important in pediatric. Uh, you know, 
uh, some doctors in the ER, uh, they are not pediatric doctor like the adult emergency, the surgeon, uh, uh, some of the reason from different specialty. So uh, it's difficult for them uh, to remember all the syndromes, but uh, why why need to give attention for these syndromes? If you see the first, uh, Okay, so if you if you see that if you if you see this uh, syndrome, uh, mainly we need to focus on neck and uh, and, and 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 chin and uh, face because dysmorphic uh, face. Uh, some syndrome they have a big tongue, small mouth. Some of them they have microgenetic like Billy Robin. Uh, some of them they have short neck. So this make very limited area to move and to do your intubation. Okay. So we'll go to the to evaluate. This is very famous uh, maneuver called three, three, two, the three fingers. Uh, so uh, uh, first of all, we start by the by the mouth opening. If you are able to put three fingers between the upper and lower teeth. This is area will be okay for for uh, for intubation, and then you will put the three finger between the uh, just below the chin to the hyoid bone. Uh, if you manage, this is will be uh, okay for the intubation, and then two finger between the hyoid and thyroid. Uh, so this is very important to do it. Sometimes difficult, uh, not logic to do it in like in cardiac arrest or in the patient who's uh, need uh, urgent intubation. And then you go to next slide. Okay, mal and Bati uh, scoring. It is a score to uh, uh, to see which class the oral cavity. So we'll go to this picture. Okay, so this is class one, two, three, four. Uh, uh, they consider class one, it's easy, very easy for intubation. Class four is difficult intubation. As I mentioned previously in, in my slides, uh, you start intubation by, by the mouth opening, this is your area. Then you go, you find the tongue, which is the big uh, anatomy structure. And then you go to this area, which is the end of the tunnel, but still there's many structures uh, after that. But, so if the tunnel is not clear for you, the intubation will be difficult. So you need to see the soft palate, hard palate, you feel a, if you start to lose of this structure, like in class two and three, this makes the intubation is difficult. Oh, obstruction. So we need to look for, uh, like from body, like abscess, tumor, soft tissue swelling, such in and bed, they have uh, significant edema that compress the, the airway and hematoma also in the trauma patient. Uh, and this usually affecting the neck. Uh, neck mobility. Neck mobility is very important. So if your patient is alert and awake, you can ask him to uh, to touch uh, by his chin the, the sternum or the chest, and then also ask him to do uh, extension for his neck. If he's able to do it, this means the area for you is easy for intubation, and this is give uh, positive B value for easy intubation. It's another uh, grade one, two, three, four, for focal cords. As I mentioned in uh, Mal and Bati scoring, if you, if, you, if you see like this in grade one, the focal cords is clear, this will be uh, easy intubation, then you will go gradually to make unfeasible focal cords. So uh, lemon consider is, 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 uh, is uh, uh, helpful in assisting uh, airway to see if they are difficult intubation or not, because contain many parts, contain a 3-3-2 rule and contain mal and bad scoring. Uh, and also, if you, high, if you have like high mal and bad score, limited mouth opening or dysmorphic feature, like I mentioned in, in some syndromes and pediatric board dentation, 
or decrease neck mobility, but, uh, 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 like in other syndrome. This means you will, you will give you clue, this intubation it will not be easy. So my home message, lemon consider as a, a accurate, a simple, informative approach to assist the airway. Uh, and thank you very much. I try to make it simple, informative, because I know it's more than 6,000 audience. So I, we need to, uh, to, uh, to summarize my approach to, to simple one. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, Dr. Faiz. Yes. I think there's a good question here, one of the uh, asked questions several times in the chat. Uh, which is better in assessing the airway, Malambati or Cork Mac? Uh, Malambati is considered as a, as a, as a safe, informative approach uh, and easy to, to apply and to identify. Oh. I think there's a question here, but it's more broad. It needs uh, a separate lecture. This is from Joy. Uh, he's asking about how will intubate a young child differ from intubation an adult? Um, I think this is a very- uh, can, can you repeat the question, Dr. Saleh? Uh, how will intubate a young child will be different from intubation of the an adult? Okay, I think this part of it, uh, oh, yeah. as, I, as you mentioned in your lecture, the difference in anatomy between adult and pediatric, and we'll be discussing more details with Dr. Mark Wetty, how, how to deal with difficult airway. The last question, uh, can you more elaborate about uh, Lyman principle? Uh, what do you mean? Can you talk about a little bit, explain more Lyman principle? And, uh, but do we, we can uh, go to the slides? Which part of lemon he wants to talk about? This this question maybe it's uh, uh, you. We'll um, go to the we'll to the I first. Ask the, the attendees, please, if you can more focus and uh, uh, on your question, so we can answer it in, in yeah. thirty seconds or less than. Maybe, maybe this slide will help him to identify each item in lemon. Okay. Any more questions, Dr. Saleh? One question here uh, from Manar Al-Ghraibi. Uh, she asked about, is it enough to use one method like three, three, two alone, or it is better to use combinations of the uh, methods? Uh, actually, they, 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 they did the... Uh, a study on this, and they found that if you compound like 332 with the Malambati, 
the it's more sensitive just to use only one one method Oh, excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fai, very much uh, for this interesting talk. Actually, we have some small uh, technical problems. Uh, now, our uh, next speaker will be Dr. Uh, Maher Al Kuwaiti. Dr. Maher Al Kuwaiti is uh, the head of uh, Pediatric Emergency uh, Medicine uh, Division. Uh, consultant pediatric emergency and consultant intensive care unit at uh, Prince Sultan Medical Military uh, City. Dr. Uh, <clears throat> Maher will talk about uh, uh, and enhance the, your, uh, your knowledge and strengthen your uh, confidence in how to deal with difficult airway, especially in the emergency uh, department. Uh, yes. Before that, also, there are so many people ask about the hours, CME hours. You will have it in your uh, Momaris, and also you will have uh, an email in your uh, email that you already attended this uh, activity. Also, I already talked to uh, Mr. Wael al Awfi, who is the in charge of uh, uh, this activity and he promised all this activity will be in uh, on YouTube okay and you can review it later in the future and thank you uh, uh, so now I uh, will leave the stage for Dr. Uh, Maher Al Kuwaiti and uh, welcome Maher Shukran Dr. Muhammad Jazakum Allah Khair Assalamu Alaikum Jami'an First of all I'd like to thank the organizing committee for uh, uh, giving us this opportunity to uh, help and participate in uh, webinars that might enhance and uh, give the people more ideas about how to deal with um, airways, uh, difficult airway scenarios, how to manage them. And knowledge is a power. If you have the power of knowledge, you will be more calm, more confident, and you could control the stressful environment and stressful situations um, that you are facing. So your performance will be much better than without knowing. Uh, you will freak out and you cannot control yourself or you can control the situations. Um, it's not... Uh, My slide is not moving, so. So I start with the, uh, the presentation with this statement, and this is a, a very fundamental statement. When you cannot breathe, nothing else is matter. This is what saved patients' life in pediatric. All the complications that might happen, the sequences of they cannot breathe, uh, either related to the cardiac with cardiopulmonary arrest or uh, the CNS complications of hypoxia or the systemic uh, disabilities or uh, morbidity that might happen because of high CO2. Um, all of that happen because they cannot breathe. So focusing on breathing meaning you're saving and you're focusing on the willing being of the uh, uh, pediatric patients. Um, my part will be managing the uh, difficult airway. Now we're going to the actual uh, see, uh, scenarios that you might face. Let's give me a, uh, give you an example. A two years old uh, present to uh, emergency and with respiratory distress and fever and uh, when you're assessing her, you find that she has is L up here, hypoxic with 88% uh, um, uh, saturation, although she's on uh, not a breathing uh, face mask. And uh, you further questions and you found that she has, she had been on a ventilator for a while in the past and it was a, not an easy um, uh, intubation. And also she is a pair of sequences. 
So as Dr. Faiz was saying, when you hear certain diseases in the history, you start, um, it's a red flag for a physician. Uh, it's a red flag for any a treating physician that are dealing with this kid. Uh, and you, it's a red flag because if you start wondering if this patient need to be intubated, is this going to be an easy intubation? Is this going to be, um, uh, is, is there anything I need to, be, to prepare before I ended up intubating these patients? And how to avoid intubating such a patient? A lot of questions that comes to your mind uh, if you have a if your patient is known case of certain syndromes that might affect you, uh, the affect the ability of intubating, or had a history of um, ICU admission, difficult airway intubation. So uh, it's always um, a scenario that you're going to think over and over and over uh, before patient reaching to a state that you will intervene immediately. Um, few definition that very commonly used in the literature or in medical field, um, uh, difficult to ventilate, difficult to intubate, or cannot ventilate, cannot intubate. Uh, the American Society of Anesthesia suggests that when you would say that this patient is difficult to ventilate, it's basically when you bag the patients and the patient is not responding to your bagging, it's not sufficient, it's not efficient, or is not uh, picking up your patients from his distress or the setting. So cannot reverse what the patient's situation is, although you're bagging, or the saturation is still uh, low. So at that moment, you say this is uh, difficult to ventilate or we call it ensure cannot ventilate. And the second part is difficult to intubate. And we call it when there is a trained physician, like an anesthetist. Uh, not like um, a junior or an intern just like graduated from uh, medical school and you would intubate and he will fail and you say this is a difficult uh, to intubate. It should be a senior or a trained physician that will attempt to try to uh, intubate the patients with a conventional, the regular laryngoscope for three times and he couldn't do it. Or it takes him more than 10 minutes to intubate the patient. At this stage, you'll say, this is uh, difficult to intubate or in short, cannot intubate. So the term cannot ventilate, cannot intubate is related to the clinical situation that you would find when, when you're managing the patient. Um, we just had the, the talk uh, from Dr. Faiz about assessing the patients with uh, difficult airway or trying to predict, is this patient going to be a difficult? Um, literature is very valuable in the accuracy of the of these uh, tools that we have to assess the patients. Uh, it is useful. It is there to use. Um, it is it make different in your clinical decision, um, but there is a variable in how much percentage that you give away on it. Uh, some of the study reach up to fifty percent. That you could say if you have a hundred patient and you did all the assessment tools on them, and 50 of them, you said, okay, they, they are fine. They didn't have any difficult airway. From these 50%, you might have some people that's difficult to intubate. And this is life, and this is realities. How, uh, regardless of how accurate our tools, it's still not 100%. And number two, uh, some of, the, um, of these tools are... Uh, child or patient dependent. Like you need to have a cooperative child to have it uh, done appropriately. Um, an example, like if you're gonna do a Malambati assessment, you need to have a sitting, a, a, the child in a sitting position and opening mouth fully, protruding his tongue. Like this is not a common child that you would face in emergency, like very cooperative, will do everything that you ask him to do. And uh, he will do it while he is sick. It's not a thing that you're gonna see it a lot. So yes, it is there to help, but there is a variant of a prevalence that you might, even with your assessment, you need to get pretty that it might turn to be a difficult. Plus, Around one in 10,000 patients, you might have 
a difficulty in ventilating the patient. You cannot ventilate. You cannot bag him very well. So even that you are not intubating, but you might fa face this situations. And my uh, next um, uh, um, a few minutes, we're going to talk about certain uh, items and we'll elaborate on them. Um, some of them in brief, some of them we're going to take some time. Um, uh, we want to build your knowledge. I want to build your uh, sense of difficulty. I want you to prepare your mindset, what I'm going to do, what's happening. And at the end, inshallah, we'll have some uh, videos to make your talent or ability of doing the procedure, inshallah, better, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or if you are doing it, uh, and so it's kind of refreshing, and it's always airway uh, uh, management is nice to have it refresh every now and then. Okay. Um, Intubation is difficult mainly for two reasons. There's a lot of reasons, but this is the main two reasons. Um, part of it related to the physician and part of it related to the patient itself. The uh, part related to the physician, it might be that he didn't do an adequate assessment. Um, I had seen a lot of trainees that they take this lightly. And I would say to them, please, this is your fundamental Yes, you cannot predict everybody, but it will predict somebody that it might change your management plan for this patient. You might say, okay, I'm gonna do for procedure sedation for this fracture. And based on your assessment, you might stop this procedure sedation in emergency and take it to the OR because you assess and you predict and you say, this is not a good candidate for emergency room sedation for the patient safety. And uh, the second part is might, you don't have the enough, uh, the equipment that you need to intubate a patient. How many times, and I'm sure, just run into your mind, how many times you uh, try to intubate a patient and you ask your team, your nurses, I need this thing. I need the um, suction uh, tube. And they say, oh, we don't have it. Let me go and grab it. Uh, or um, I need like the pulse oximetry is not uh, joining very well. So like you don't have the enough equipment to have it. So it might give you a, a difficulty because it's adding a stress to your uh, position. You don't have the enough experience, which is very well known. Like uh, people who just graduated or early in their life of managing patient, they might have confidence. They don't feel confident uh, with themselves, but the, the more they do, the more they get confidence and expert. Um, poor technique. And just go with me, uh, guys. Um, how many times be, you've been taught and I've been taught by uh, our professors or doctors or consultants that when you do a laryngoscope, the conventional laryngoscope, please start from the side of the tongue, push it away, and um, lift up the whole laryngoscope of the tongue. Most of the trainee or physician, what they would do, they would do angulating. They will lift the uh, tip of the, uh, of the blade upward. It's not the whole uh, laryngoscope, just only the tip. They do angulating. Or they put a pressure on the teeth, which might broke a tooth because of the, uh, you are putting the pressure in, in an area that you shouldn't put a pressure. So you're not doing it appropriately. So if you're not doing it right, you're not gonna get the right result. Do it in the right way, you get the right result. Um, then you don't have a functioning, uh, you, you ask a nurse, okay, I'm seeing the vocal cord, I have some secretion, give me the suction, then it's not working. It's an equipment failure. It's not your fault, it's not uh, the nurse's fault, but equipment failure, it's affecting your ability to intubate patients. Or you wanted to use the laryngoscope, then you put it in, you attach it, the light is not working. And why is that? Oh, the battery is not is dead. We need to change the battery. And you, oh, we don't have a battery alarm. These scenarios just happen a lot. These scenarios make your life is not easy because it shouldn't have done unfinished intubation by the time. Just, you're solving the battery that's not around 
in your uh, uh, that moment in the stations. Um, and the next step, number six, this is very critical. If you don't have a clear plan, what I will do next, you're deciding that I want to fail and I don't want to think that uh, fail, failing is an issue. Because if you think had any of these issues in the, in the top five, or for any other reason, you couldn't intubate and you didn't prepare yourself or prepare your mind that things might not be good and you didn't think what I have to do if I couldn't intubate, believe me, your brain is not gonna function properly during the critical scenarios. And just imagine yourself in the oral exam or um, a mock uh, uh, scenarios. During the discussion or even the morning report uh, round, have it ever happened to you that during the discussion or the questions of the oral exam, they ask you questions and you're getting stressed up, then you feel that you're freeze, your mind is jammed, your mind is not thinking properly. Although after you finish the whole things or the exam or whatever, you could say to yourself, I know the answer, why I couldn't answer them because your mind or your brain cannot function properly when you are not used to sit, to sit up your brain to the next level, to the next part of your management, to the next question that might happen. When the adrenaline is rushing, cortisol is not feeling, your brain starts to not thinking fast enough to help you out. So before you ended up in the and the chaos of the scenario, please think what I need to do next if I couldn't do it. Next part is even better. You're starting the, yeah, yeah, and you start thinking, okay, I cannot do the intubation. So my plan will be, uh, let's see, number two. What is number two? Number two is this, is this and this and this. That's fine, excellent. What happened in the real scenarios? You keep doing number one. You failed, you repeat it, you failed, you repeat it, you failed. It takes you a long time to move to the, the next step, although you know it, although you have said it to yourself, but you stuck to the first management line. If you don't practice that, I need to move, I need to move faster, I need to move forward, you're not gonna go anywhere. We teach people in the, in the uh, pulse or the trauma scenarios that you need to have an act, IV access. If you cannot do it in seconds, you need to have an IO. We're not giving you a chance. This equal this, I cannot do it, I will proceed to IO. This is how you do it, this is you, how you move. The second part is related to the patient. Uh, Either it's congenital causes, as we said, uh, the perrobins or hygroma, cystic hygroma, um, airway uh, malformations, or acquired like in what happened in the in the uh, trauma scenarios. Okay. Now, I understand that I need to think what I have to do uh, before intubation. So, what my checkpoint will be? I need to assist the airway. You need to uh, arrange a senior help. If you are a trainee or you are a specialist or you do not have enough experience, please call in advance to uh, somebody that has the experience to help you out. I had my professor 20 years of intensive care experience, 20 years. And we had a case that uh, a very sick patient, uh, dysmorphic, and we decide to intubate him. You know what he did? He called the anesthesia in the OR. He's saying, listen, I'm going to, going to intubate this patient who's really sick and has difficult airway. I'm doing it, but I'm giving you a heads up. In case we cannot do it, we might call you. He didn't deny that, oh, I am 20 years experience of intensive care, so I should do this easily. I couldn't, I, why I would need that? No, 
This is patient safety. This is patient care. This is patient's life that I need to plan for it. Next point is we need to check the availability of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the tools that you have. Is it available? Is it working at the same time? And you test it. Is it the suction is working? Is the light is on? Is the AT tube all AT tube is all, all available? Uh, Lately, uh, the last point is run through the difficult airway algorithm. What is step one? What is step two? What is what gonna happen if I couldn't do? What's the next step? And it's very, yani ad advocate if your area doesn't have uh, the difficult airway algorithm, have it available with you uh, or in the area that you like typical interstitial area that people can read it at the time of uh, difficult airway scenarios. Um, so how to make sure that everything is prepared and all the things I need is there. People start thinking, should we get a checklist and should we memorize it? What, what, what do we have to do to make things clear and nice and easy? Then the idea comes up of the difficult airway trolley. You make a trolley, it's like a crush cart, a nice trolley, have everything that you would need for the difficult airway management, all the tools and the equipment, and it is labeled, if you could see in the pictures, and it has monitors on top of them. And it's, as I told you, it's contained like, it's easy, removable, uh, it has four or five drawers, and everything that you need is in there like a close picture of the different companies that making uh, the trolleys um, and we're going to go uh, through that At the top they usually have the monitors what monitors they have is the video laryngoscope uh, kind of monitor like the vib uh, fiber scope um, or the, port the portable scope or the monitor that patient might be attached to monitor or co2 detector uh, tidal CO2 um, monitor. Um, the side pumps. Hello? I cannot hear you, Mohammed. Uh, you have eight minutes now. Yeah. Okay. That's why it's better. Yes. Thank you, Mohammed. Side trolley contains the bougie, uh, which is the one of the instrument that might help you to uh, uh, pointing to the or reaching out to the trachea so you could easily intubate the patient and the entry and the incubation catheter. So what's a drawer that's in there? Um, drawer one, uh, it's usually contain the, uh, sometimes the bougie or different type of laryngoscope. Uh, uh, sizes or the um, blade, uh, straight, curved, or uh, something like uh, this uh, type of scope, they call it McCoy. Uh, it has a handle that you could push and then the tip of the blade move the epiglottis upward so you could intubate the patient uh, easily. Drawer two has the supraglottic type of uh, uh, instrument, which mainly LMAs, uh, laryngeal mask uh, airway or the fibroscope uh, airway and this is in the drawer two. Drawer three is the uh, mask devices like uh, face mask, uh, ambu bags, oropharynx, nasopharynx, the thing that keep the patient airway. Drawer four is the surgical uh, devices for cricothyroidotomy and all the equipment that you need in there. Okay. Uh, how to keep all this draw, drawer together and the assessment and the patients and the strategy? Uh, we're gonna use, there's different algorithm available in the, in the literature, but today I'm gonna talk to you about the uh, Difficult Airway Society. Difficult Airway Society has uh, a nice algorithm. They pointed out, they divide the algorithm to uh, four uh, plane. Uh, if you can see it on the left side of the screen, Blaine A, Blaine B, Blaine C, and Blaine C, D. And there is a, a dot between each plane, which means if you are on Blaine A, you're gonna try it with a direct laryngoscope. If you cannot do it, 
which is the usual scenario that we're doing. Then you move to plane, the second step, which is plane B, using the LMAs, you cannot do it. You take a breath and you back the patient and you start thinking, if this is not an emergency situation, I will quit and I'll wake the patient up if I'm sedating him. Or this is an emergency, I need to intubate the patient. So you move again to the LMA or the surgical uh, pathway. Um, so direct scope, LMA, then back the patients, then think, should you uh, waking up the patient or you, move, you proceed for surgical? Um, this is how put it all together. You cannot intubate the patient with a plan A, optimize the position of the head, the pediatric airway is not as the adult, so we need to put something under the head to make the vision of the view is straight line. You might need to use a bogey, or you change the scope, the laryngoscope to the Miller, McGill, uh, um, McIntosh, short, long, so you could have different strategy to try. If you cannot do it, move to the second step, which is the LMAs or the uh, fiber optic scope, like the glidoscope. You cannot do it. You bag the patient and you keep the airway of patents by the nasopharynx or the oropharynx. And then you decide that I need to continue. This is an emergency situation. So you move to blend D, which is the surgical, either through the needle, cannula, or through the surg surgical cricothyroidotomy. I hope it's clear uh, that you have four stages that you need to go from one to two to three to four, and do not stay in one stage uh, to finish the uh, scenarios. Okay, so now it's time for the action. We're gonna display to you some of the devices that's available and how to use it. Inshallah, we could have the time uh, to run through all the videos that were prepared. This is just to give you an example. There is different type of blade, straight, the McGill or the McIntosh, which is the Care, or the Miller, or the McCoy that I just uh, told you about. The bougie is uh, the yellow things that's down the, uh, the screen. Uh, it's elastic part, uh, long. And uh, it's nice that when you pass through the vocal cord, if you could see in the right upper, you're gonna feel the tracheal ring. So feeling the tracheal ring through the bougie means that you are in the, already in the trachea. So you slide uh, the ATT over the, uh, the bougie, so you are in the uh, airway. The subregulatory airway device, the, the left side picture, this is what you used to see, the LMA. The right side is up, yeah, and getting more famous nowadays, and they call it the intubating LMA and or the uh, uh, fast track. Uh, this lower part has two balloons, they call it the combi tube. I'm gonna to talk to them uh, about them now. The combi tube is very beautiful device, very nice. They're just telling you, just put the tube, regardless where is it going, in the esophagus and the trachea, it's gonna work. It has two balloons. One balloon is gonna obliterate the upper part of the airway. The other balloon will obliterate whatever this place he is in. Like in the uh, upper right, the, the tube went already to the esophagus. So when you inflate the, uh, the balloons, there is hole in the middle that they're gonna, the air will go to the trachea. And the lower uh, picture, the tube went already to the trachea. So you inflate the two balloons, the holes in the middle cannot push air a lot because it's in the narrow space. So the air will go to the trachea from lower part. So either it goes to the air, to the esophagus or the trachea, it's gonna ventilate, it's gonna work. So it's a nice, good uh, device to use. And the upper balloon, the big one, it will minimize the amount of the aspiration that's gonna happen. Let me, we, we had seen this and been taught about it. You just use it. Uh, you, you hold it as a pencil between two fingers, which is the picture uh, B and uh, the upper right. Then you start pushing it inside the mouth and till you feel a mild resistance, that means it's sitting in the area that's supposed to be and it's facing the uh, epiglottis. So when you um, bag the patient, he will have it nice. 
Um, so this is the, the this type of LMA. This is what we used to see. This is what everybody told us. This is the LMA. Nowadays, there is a lot of LMAs, and every one of them has a unique um, character than the other one. Uh, the classic that we just had the picture on it, and we have the flexible, the unique, uh, the fast track, the fast track, which is the intubating that we just saw. Uh, the uh, Brusil and the IGL and the uh, C-TRAC. See how many type of LME that available in the market and every one of them has uh, its own function and its own uh, uh, vector. I'm gonna go through some of them. Uh, this is the, um, the intubating. So you have, you could see there is, uh, there is a handle. I don't know if you could see the pointer, I'm pointing to the handle. Um, and there is an elevated part here. That elevated part will elevate the epiglottis. So when you put the tube in the uh, LMA, it will go direct to the trach. Very beautiful device. You don't have to have a lot of skill. You just put the LMA, then put the tube on it. And it's very functioning very well. The uh, C trach, uh, it's like the... Uh, intubating LMA, but with the uh, video camera. So it make it more nicer and uh, beautiful to see where is the tube is going uh, when you intubate. I'll give you just an example, it's two minutes videos. So after he back, so he is easily to, to, to ventilate. See how he just put the LMA and he used the handle to push it down. So now the LMA in place, you just inflate the uh, the cuff and you're gonna try it to see if there is effective position. You didn't see, it's a blind procedure. Just notice that he pushed the handle a bit lower so he could get the lung inflated. So he, and he's keeping holding the handle. Now you just push the uh, tube down to the LMAs, and that's it. Inflate the cuff of the tube. Make sure it's secure. Then you start bagging. Very nice and very easy, and you don't have to need a lot of skill to do it. Okay, now see how he removed the LMA. So he can take out the, uh, the adapter, um, the deflate the LMA, he kept the uh, uh, tube uh, inflated. So he deflate the cup of the LMA. Um, now he will use the uh, tube exchanger just on the tip of the tube, then he will push out the LMA. You don't need to push the tube, the exchanger, just sliding the LMA. Once the LMA is out and you could hold the tube, the AT tube, hold it and remove the LMA from its positions. Now check the LMA and the tube is still there and still functioning. Beautiful. So easy, nothing to worry about and uh, nice to be done. Okay. Um, the uh, Prusil type of LMA, it has a character um, uh, ish, uh, things about it. It has two lumen, if you could see in the picture, and there's a hole at the end of the cuff. So they notice with the classic that if you put that in the uh, upper airway, they might have have a gastric secretion. Where is it going? So they found this to go through the hole to the tube outward. So the gastric secretion will be out. The fiber optic, there's a lot of devices available. This is the classic fiber optic. This is the uh, the CMAC, the uh, cigars, the glidoscope, and this is the most beautiful thing I like, the air track. Um, and we'll talk about it in a second. This is just a quick idea how we do glidoscope uh, uh, intubation using basically four steps. 
A four-step technique to GlideScope video laryngoscopy combines direct vision of the patient with views on the GlideScope video monitor. Start by looking in the mouth to introduce the laryngoscope. At the screen to obtain the best glottic view. Back in the mouth to introduce the endotracheal tube. And finally, at the screen to intubate. Begin step one with direct vision, looking directly into the patient's mouth. With the patient appropriately positioned and with the GlideScope video laryngoscope in your left hand, introduce the GlideScope into the midline of the oral pharynx. Gently advance the GlideScope until the tip of the laryngoscope is past the posterior portion of the tongue. Unlike conventional laryngoscopy, the GlideScope video laryngoscope is introduced midline. No lateral displacement of the tongue is required. Step 2 is performed while viewing the video monitor the entire time. With the GlideScope inserted, look to the monitor to identify the epiglottis. Then manipulate the scope to obtain the best glottic view. The glottic view Uh, uh, Dr. Maher, uh, uh, we already, uh, the time is over, and uh, there will be another video that will show the same uh, glidoscope. I will move, I will move from the glidoscope. Yeah, Thank you. Bye. is optimized by a combination. Uh, the new generation of the glidoscope is the uh, triangle. It can be attached to the uh, mobile, uh, just a scope, a portable scope, like a wire that can attach your mobile and give you, and use the screen of your mobile. Um, this I'm gonna give you just a quick videos about uh, how to use the uh, that uh, in a different uh, plan, it's air track. This, uh, this is uh, Donna, and Donna's our uh, manager for our Simbe and experienced uh, paramedic and AIM instructor. And she's going to show us the uh, air track uh, um, video attachment. Okay, so this attachment's for any. Okay, I don't know what happened with the previous uh, lecture of uh, Dr. Maher uh, al Kuwaiti, but uh, anyway, thank you, Maher, very much. And if there is any questions, please, you can uh, send it to question and answer, and we will uh, forward it to Dr. Maher. Inshallah, he will answer it soon. Uh, now, <clears throat> I think uh, our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Ahmed Abdullah Al Madi. Ahmed Abdullah Al Madi, he is uh, a pediatrician and uh, he is uh, also uh, uh, assistant professor of pediatric at Al Faisal University. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Al Madi, he did uh, uh, his uh, fellowship in ultrasound uh, in uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School. And uh, in Boston, Dr. Hamad Al Madi, he will uh, give us a brief about uh, point of care ultrasound in the airway assessment. Before that, please, I just would like to announce very important for all our participants uh, on May 30, May 30, 30, we will have infection control uh, course. This is uh, 30 hours, 30 hours. Uh, it is four days, and also we have a very interesting co uh, course, uh, pediatric emergency uh, uh, course. This will be uh, from uh, uh, June 13 to 15. It is uh, 24 hours, and you can register through our uh, coordinators here, and uh, you are most welcome. Uh, now I will leave uh, the talk to uh, Dr. Hamid Al Madi to start. Please start and try your best to stick to the time, guys. Thank you very much. 
شكرا دكتور محمد ماي ساوند از كلير ذا سلايد از كلير فيري كلير ما شاء الله ثانك يو دكتور محمد اي هوب ماي ماي توك اند از فيري ايزي فور افري وان Uh, uh, my uh, presentation will be cover uh, introduction uh, how to use the ultrasound in the uh, difficult airway and how to utilize this uh, machine in the uh, airway assessment and uh, we'll be uh, try to go through how to make good uh, uh, estimation of the appropriate uh, size for endotracheal tube and how to uh, localize the uh, crocothyroid membrane for emergency airway uh, access and how to confirm the AT tube placement. And you have to use a useful method for detecting uh, both extubation strider, especially for patient who is uh, in uh, BICU. Uh, the last part for my uh, presentation will be covered the diaphragmatic movement uh, and uh, contractility evaluation by ultrasound. You know, this is ultrasound. This is one of the uh, important uh, machine coming to the, the to the, uh, the uh, to the emergency or the critical area and to utilize this machine for the different uh, procedure and application especially for that patient uh, going for um, a difficult airway so uh, the ultrasound is very helpful for assessment of the airway may provide the clinician with the valuable information that uh, uh, is uh, specific for the uh, individual airway the uh, static or dynamic uh, during the uh, procedure of the intubation the ultrasound can be helped to identify the focal cord uh, dysfunction also, and uh, if there is any abnormal or pathology or congenital anomaly, uh, as uh, mentioned by Dr. Um, uh, Faiz and Dr. Maher and Dr. Uh, Saleh about the, the, the normal anom uh, anatomy and how to be can differentiate if there is any uh, or predict if there is uh, abnormality in this focal cord and to be easy and to be uh, ready for that uh, problem uh, and uh, to be uh, um, predicted uh, uh, before you are facing this one during the intubation. The ultrasound can be uh, assess the airway size and predict that appropriate diameter of the endotracheal and the tracheostomy tube and the, the can be differentiated the tracheal and the esophageal intubation. And also this ultrasound can be localized the crocodile brain and the, uh, in the emergency situation, as mentioned by Dr. Maher, is very important and very crucial, important to be localized the uh, crocodile brain uh, during that uh, difficult or you are unstuck for this patient and you have to help this Situation. So it is very easy to localize this one by ultrasound and to be guided for this one or to go for the trichostomy. First of all, you have to be familiar for what you have to start it by which probe. It's very important. You have to go for the uh, curve linear or the high frequency or uh, that uh, other other option. No, you need a very high frequency for this patient. So it's very important to select the correct probe for this patient, especially if you are dealing with a pediatric age. Pediatric age, you have uh, facing uh, a lot of uh, obstacle for this one. You will face this patient is will be short neck and not easy to be find good space for that probe to be, keep this one uh, suprasternal. So it's very important to select this one is high frequency. Okay, then you have to be searching which one is very small footprint to be easy for to keep this one easy in this small area. So is the hockey stick uh, high frequency is one of the good option for you to go for this one and for scanning. So when you start examination, you have to show, uh, 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 go for two uh, uh, the, uh, both uh, approach for transfers and uh, trunk tendula view, and you have to keep the patient in supine position, and you have to ask in snapping position, and you keep the the, the head a little bit uh, flex a little bit to be easy for you to uh, scan the patient. Yeah. Uh, when you put, uh, when you start to make good assessment for the airway, it's very important to to be scanning the first the mouth and oropharynx and tonsil before start of before intubate the patient. So you have to identify the localized uh, localization of the oral structure like that um, uh, uh, the tongue and also the tonsil and the other structure is uh, in the mouth so it's very important first you will really keep the keep the probe you can keep this uh, probe is is the in the mentum area 
okay and the direction of that probe will be in the right side okay uh, and will be visualize the the mouth the, the mouth will be visualized the tongue with this short cut for this the tongue and will be the mandible okay and the, this is the edge of the tongue and will be the floor of the muscle of the the the, the muscle uh, the floor uh, the muscle in the floor so uh, easy for you to be localized and to be see if there is any uh, uh, congenital uh, anomaly or there is any deformity or anything will be uh, facing this uh, uh, during the uh, or will be encounter on, on, during that uh, intubation. So it's very easy to be to be uh, uh, to be uh, predicted uh, early. So after that, sorry. So after that, you can go after that. You can rotate the probe to be uh, 90 degree. Okay, this will be show the tank muscle and you can see the long cut for the tank and also the also the other few for the uh, muscle in the floor of the mouth and the other cut for the mandible and the artifact. So after finishing from this one, you can go to make other cut of few scanning for this patient by keep the probe under the mandible. So when you keep the, uh, the indicator will be uh, uh, more anterior. So you can ask the patient to be just tilt and to rotate the uh, head to the other side. So, and uh, will be visualized the tonsil. This is the tonsil and will be, can be easy to be see if there is any abscess or there is any uh, uh, large in the size to be easy to be easy to predict it is and to, to be, be fine this is patient will be difficult airway and to be uh, prepare yourself for the uh, bad scenario if you uh, think this is patient is not easy to be intubated so we will be see that tonsil and will be see that uh, some mandibular uh, gland and this is the artifact of the mandible okay um, after that when you finish from this one you will go for what you will be uh, uh, make a good uh, uh, scanning uh, infrahyoid region to visualize the trachea and focal cords. It's very important. It's very important and very crucial, important anatomical structure. You have to be visualized and to be ready for any bad scenario for this one. So you will see if there is any, any abnormality. So you can see in this one, this is the larynx and this is the, uh, uh, you can see the cartilage, uh, the thyroid cartilage. This is the car thyroid cartilage. You can see the artifact for this one. Um, uh, don't, uh, uh, miss uh, um, diagnosed uh, for that um, uh, false uh, cord. Sometimes you can see this one and you label this one, this is the focal cord. No, this is not the focal cord, this is the false cord. So sometimes we will be mistaken to be uh, missing this one is uh, this one is uh, fo fo focal cord. No, how can differentiate this is focal cord, uh, um, false co co cord, uh, from that uh, true focal cord, you can see, and this is the that uh, um, uh, scanning. This is hypoechoic in this area, and in the true cord, a focal cord, it will be hypoechoic. So if this is hypoechoic, this is fat. So it's not a real uh, focal cord. So you have to go little bit caudally by the transducer to find that's more hypoechoic. This is you are visualizing the focal cord. You see this focal cord will be junction in the anterior commissure and, uh, and the, the posterior will be more going more lateral and will be junction to the arytenoid, the cartilage. So uh, that's the fault on that fiber will be more hyperechoic than the focal cords. So we have to be more familiar for this one to be easy to uh, uh, visualize and scanning. Uh, after that, you can go uh, infrahyoid will be you, usually the hyoid bone is not easy for that pediatric age, so it's one of the difficulty for scanning in the pediatric. So more easy and more uh, um, um, approachable for that uh, for the adult age. But this is the pediatric will be is not uh, will develop that uh, uh, hyoid bone. So you have to go um, uh, to be uh, scanning for first to go up 
اور كرونال اور سيفاليك ذن ويل جو انفيريور تو جاست تو لوكينج فور وير از ذا ثايرويد اند تريكيا اف يو فايند ذا تريكيا ذيس از ذا تريكيا ذيس ون فيري كلير اند ويل بي سين ذا ثايرويد جلاند ذا ثايرويد جلاند از فيري كلير ناو اند وي كان فايند ذا كاروتيد اند ذا ذيس ذات يو كان ذيس ذا جرين ون اي ويل بي ذات Uh, esophagus usually more posterior and more, uh, uh, more in the left side. It's very important why you mentioned this one is important during the intubation uh, and to be uh, familiar for this is anatomical uh, uh, structure when you intubate the patient. Yeah, uh, as you mentioned, this is the trachea, this is the gas, this is the artifact. We can see a line for this one, the artifact, and this is the thyroid, and this is the internal jugular and the carotid. You can see that one uh, very clear. And you see this is the um, thyroid gland. And we can see the asphagus it will be more lateral and more uh, going with the um, uh, more posterior. So this is the cartilage or ring of this is the, the trachea. And we can see the artifact and the air will be more posterior. So after that you can after that's um, doing the transfer approach for this patient you have to go for um, um, a longitudinal approach to visualize the other ring of the trachea and you can visualize the car carotid uh, cartilage and the thyroid cartilage the thyroid cartilage will be more uh, um, uh, cephalic as mentioned by dr saleh and then will be uh, uh, crocothyroid membrane It's very important in the surgical airway. Then you can find the the crocoid cartilage and then the rings of the trachea. Sometimes you can be mistaken uh, label the um, um, the ring of the trachea to be as a crocoid cartilage. So you have to be more familiar for the structure, how it looks, the cartilage, how can differentiate this is the anatomical structure from each other. So just to uh, review this one, uh, I think Dr. Saleh, he mentioned this one very uh, um, 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 clear and you have to uh, we not repeat this uh, uh, on what he mentioned, Dr. Saleh. I just only mentioned this one very quick to, to remember this one when you uh, scan the animation. You know, this is that uh, larynx. Larynx, we can see this is the thyroid cartilage with a little bit uh, more uh, sharp angle. So is when you scan the patient, we will be find that more sharp angle, this will be the thyroid cartilage. Then when you go caudally or inferior, would be seen like this is that fossa or left like tibia, this one, you can like this thyroid, uh, thyroid uh, crocothyroid membrane. Then when you go more inferior, we can find the, uh, the crocoid cartilage, then the ring of the, uh, of the trachea. Why is very important? Also, you can find the crocoid cartilage. This is very important. The narrowest area, it is more superior. Okay? When you make any uh, the, um, 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 measurement for this one, uh, for diameter, it's very important to be uh, uh, measure this one from uh, superior because the narrowest area is very important to be um, uh, help to predict what is the size of the tube. You know, this is the carotid muscle, and this is the sinohyoid muscle and the sinohyoid muscle. But go back for this is the ultrasound. You can see that's more sharp this one and more uh, sharp angle. This is the 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 uh, thyroid cartilage. Then will be go. This is the membrane. Then the more harm like this one. This is the carotid cartilage. And then you can see the. The, and the, the, the rings of the trachea. So it's very easy for you when you scan this one. You can start by transfer position, then you can go the uh, long uh, approach, longitudinal approach. After this, you can you have to be scanned for uh, any patient, uh, finish from the upper airway to go for the lung. You can't be have to be sure that is good sliding. Why is very important? I will tell you later on why important in the upper airway. The airway is very important to be part from this scanning to be familiar for the pleura and this is the uh, rib shadow and this is the artifact of the rib shadow. So that pleura is very important. Dr. Kiha, how is it? Abu Yasir, my dear. Visualize. Visualize. Abu Ish. 
فيجواليز ذا بلور اب الله يحفظها الله يحفظها ميوتها كلهم يا شيخ ميوت بليز مايك بليز يا افتر ذات ذا بلور اب will be can find the uh, uh, sliding. It's very important to be sure for the sliding. And if you are not sure about the slide, you can use the M mode to be see the C show for this one to be sure this is patient is good sliding bilateral. And you can see that A line, this is the artifact. This is the normal lung uh, can be scanned. This is the patient. Um, this one is very important to be- The objective of one. this video is to demonstrate ultrasound guided identification of airway structures essential for the establishment this of a surgical- This video is very important to be just summarize what- We I begin mean. our examination just cranial of the sternal notch with a probe held transversely. The trachea here marked in orange is air filled, which makes it hypoechoic and therefore dark. So is cartilage as you can see with the tracheal ring, which we here mark in red. As we move the probe in a cranial direction, we see a series of tracheal rings. And we now approach our first important anatomical landmark, the thyroid gland, here marked in purple. And we can see both the lobes and the isthmus. And this is very important to localize during a percutaneous tracheostomy in order to avoid injury. The next structure that appears is the cricoid cartilage, here highlighted in yellow. It's a horseshoe-shaped, slightly larger cartilage ring. Just cranially, we see the cricothyroid membrane, which appears as a sharp white line with parallel lines underneath, so-called reverberation artifacts, which appear when there is a distinct tissue-air interface. Further cranially, we see the thyroid cartilage, which appears as an upside down V, here highlighted in red. We can also assess the muscles of the vocal cords, here highlighted in blue. We can, for example, see if they move symmetrically. They become even more apparent when the model phonates. As we move back caudally over the neck, you can see we the see focus the structures cortex, this one. again. The cricothyroid membrane, the cricoid cartilage, tracheal rings, and the thyroid gland. We can also shift our probe slightly to the left. And here we see a muscular structure in the middle of the picture, lateral to the trachea. This is the esophagus, which we here highlight in pink. It becomes even more apparent as the model swallows and we can see the peristaltic movement. This can be useful to identify in order to rule out an esophageal intubation. As we turn the probe 90 degrees to the longitudinal orientation, we see the tracheal rings as a string of black pearls. As we move the probe cranially, we come to a larger hypoechoic structure. This is the cricoid cartilage. Beyond that is the cricothyroid membrane. And cranial to that, we begin to discern the thyroid cartilage. We highlight them once again in color for clarity. A technique that can be used to mark the membrane involves taking a small cannula and moving it carefully under the probe. We see the shadow coming in from the right here. When the shadow is precisely above the cricothyroid membrane, we remove the probe and mark the skin with a pen. This can be an extra level of precaution during high-risk intubations in order to be more prepared if the need for a surgical airway was to arise. Okay. <clears throat> uh, then we'll go for how to we make good assessment for that uh, subglottic uh, region by that ultrasound for uh, estimation of that uh, appropriate side for endotracheal tube. Um, this is a study done in the 112 patient uh, from the 3 to 18 years uh, from both uh, gender with the normal airway. Uh, all this is one for elective schedule for surgery. This is um, uh, pre-anesthesia with doing uh, ultrasound for subglottic region. 
uh, in snapping position for any information to be uh, estimated for uh, the subcritical trachea uh, diameter to estimate the selected appropriate size for integrated tube. And then when we compare this one statically uh, to correlate with the uh, uh, clinical uh, 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 for intubation. So we find this one, the edge tube uh, size clinically used for intubation, just only estimated by the clinical, we'll find very close and very similar to that patient is estimated by the diameter of uh, uh, estimated by the ultrasound. When you go to the estimation by the formula, that's one based on the age, would be seeing this little bit uh, far away from that estimation by clinical. So the ultrasound is very close, that's estimated by clinical approach. There is other study done um, um, for assessment for subglutic uh, region for estimation of the appropriate endotracheal size in the pediatric. 150 from age two to six years old. This is randomly. This is going for um, group A. Group A, this would be estimation by the attitude by the subacolytic diameter by the ultrasound. The other group A, uh, that's formula, called formula. Uh, the result, the uh, is it of the appropriate uh, tube selection, just only 74.7, so, uh, that's um, 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 sensitivity of the ultrasound compared to the uh, formula is just only 45. So it's more superior the ultrasound. How's the accuracy? Yeah, uh, crocothyroid membrane. Uh, it's very helpful. And uh, this is study uh, done uh, in, in patient, and this used for uh, ultrasound to make good measurement for the uh, membrane. Uh, that's patient who going for MRI for the head as elective. So we make measurement by MRI, then with the ultrasound. We found this is that pediatric radiologist review the MRI measurement will be almost the same as the uh, out, uh, measurements. So is total 22 patient is included on road in the study. Um, how to can make this one for crocodile membrane? It's very important to find that trickle uh, and transfers to look for the filled tube. Then we can see that uh, thyroid. And then we can shift the change this uh, to be a uh, long axis to rotate this one long, uh, longitudinal section to identify the, uh, the string of the bill of that uh, uh, trachea. Then that's the hum of that uh, crocoid to be easy to refine. Then we can see that uh, um, uh, that's, that uh, one is the crocoid cartilage. Then they can be like step off or like dimpling this one. This one go, then it's sharp. This one, this one, the crocoid cartilage, this crocoid membrane, this is the, the other one, the, um, the thyroid cartilage. So this is the membrane. It's very clear and very easy to be uh, landmark this one and to be localized this membrane. Shortcut for this is the thyroid cartilage. Like this is very sharp, like this is angle. Uh, um, and you can see the, how is the difference between the, uh, the, the cartridge of this one, uh, the crocoid cartridge from that um, uh, thyroid cartridge. And you can see that the, the uh, membrane is very uh, different uh, uh, at the shortcut when you compare the, this one to the crocoid cartridge. Um, how to be used ultrasound to be for confirmation? It's very, uh, very important to be um, seeing this one in the recent uh, evidence and uh, has supported to use this point of care of the ultrasound of the, uh, for prediction of that as a visual versus, uh, versus trachea intubation. You find this is the sensitivity of this one is around 100. So in the last report in 2015, an American Heart Association guideline updated for cardiopulmonary resuscitation and emergency cardiovascular care, recommended to tool for the confirmation of the correct tube position when the uh, the carbon dioxide uh, monitoring is not available. So the evidence of the use of the body of care ultrasound is determine the location of the tube within the trachea or however the is uh, still limited and very potential uh, field to be for research.
So this is uh, qu um, um, paper is for ultrasonography for the intertracheal tube uh, uh, position in the infant and in the literature by uh, all that research in English language and of it and midline. And uh, he find all that relate to the pediatric or child or infant or unit uh, relate to the ultrasound for intubation. He found just only 12 paper um, five of six of them is in uh, infant and unit, and uh, uh, five, uh, six paper also from uh, age one to 18 years old. So this paper, you can see, this is the same approach what I mentioned in the beginning. The tube and the tip of the tube uh, and related to the um, uh, aortic arch and find how sensitivity. Some of that is published, this one is very close uh, to 100. So it's very promising number to be used and utilize this one for uh, approaching of the patient for uh, to confirm confirmation of the tube in the in the in the trachea, and uh, this is uh, the five study uh, uh, published. This one is uh, in um, um, from age of one. Um, um, some of that study is not depend on the suprasternal, just only in the movement of the diaphragm. So movement of the diaphragm to confirm this is the tube is in place or the correct place. Uh, some uh, of this study just only focusing on the curcuterm brain and make pressure on this one to push, push the gas to be to decrease the artifact to be clear visualize the attitude. Um, so in the End of this study, he found uh, reported more than 80% of the visualizing of the ET tube uh, tip is uh, by ultrasound, and the largest study of the uh, accomplished by uh, offered 90% of visualizing in the ultrasound compared to chest uh, X-ray is uh, concordance of this one. Almost of this old study, a very effective and visualized the ET tube tip and uh, placing the ultrasound probe uh, mid. Uh, so, so, surgically and uh, just uh, and to be visualized the, uh, the, the tip of that uh, the tube to be confirmed this one. Uh, several study is in older children report ultrasound is uh, comparable to the capnography and some of the study in the adults is more superior to the capnography. Uh, how to be uh, utilize this ultrasound? Just to, if you want to find this tube is mal uh, mal position to be too high. If uh, if you can see that artifact of that tube is in place in that cannot see the tip of the uh, the tube. If you can see the see that tip of the tube, that means you are um, is more high. So too high. So you have to uh, push this tube. Uh, if you you can you cannot see that the tip of the tube, but you cannot uh, visualize the uh, bilateral uh, sliding. So you have to, you are more deep. So you have to pull the tube. Some study is uh, use a combination of this is uh, to be avoid the exposed division for any more chest X-ray for the, to confirm that tube in place. So if you are going for intubation. I have to be sure this is trachea is in um, uh, going for trachea ultrasound, and you can go for transfer and long long uh, uh, long longitudinal approach. If you can't see the 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 um, tube uh, or not, if you can see this tube or artifact of the tube is good, uh, then you can go for uh, long. This is the tip of the tube or not? If you can't see this one. Man, this meaning that if the tube is superior, you have to be uh, bush this one. If you know, you have to go for the chest to find if there is a good sliding bilateral or not. If it's good sliding bilateral, that's good tube is correct uh, position. If not, that's meaning you have to pull this tube. Uh, some will ask me about uh, what, uh, if you cannot see the artifact of that tube in the trachea, yeah? you, sometimes you can use uh, um, other technique this one and deflate this one. If that's trachea change in the diameter, that's meaning that tube is in. If you cannot see that artifact, 
So other 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 technique, if you can, if you feel some difficulty, you cannot see the, the artifact of the tube. So you can see this one, this is the trachea, and this is the esophagus. If you, the, if the esophagus is after intubation, can see two trachea, that's meaning the tube is going to the esophageal uh, intubation, is not in tracheal uh, intubation. Uh, other important, um, other, other study is focusing of uh, a post uh, extubation strider. Is very many many uh, literature, but there is a conflict point in some uh, um, research. Uh, if you can use this one uh, ultrasound uh, to be uh, predict whose patient will go for strider of post excavation or not. Some you just to make good measurement of the um, uh, the air before the um, uh, deflate the balloon. Then after the inflate, deflate the balloon, you can see that measurement of the colon of the air, if it's uh, increase or decrease. If increase, that's good sign. This patient most likely will be not going for strider. Uh, and if it's uh, decrease, that's when your patient most likely will go for strider. The last part of my uh, presentation, how to make good assessment of the diaphragm. Someone you ask me, why you also relate of the diaphragm for that uh, uh, upper airway? It's very important and very important and very crucial for patient. If the patient is uh, have uh, the diaphragmatic paralysis or there is any problem, he will be a uh, failure for extubation or failure for, for the patient to be take normal breathing. So what's important thing approach for that uh, diaphragm is just you can focus on two important uh, technique, thickness of the diaphragm and also the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the excursion of that uh, diaphragm. You can see that's approach, sorry. Yeah, you can put the probe where you can put that probe, you can in the between the mid clavicular line and mid uh, in the anterior axillary line, and you can put between the uh, uh, intercostal space seven to nine, and you can put the probe perpendicular and ninety degree angle, and to visualize the diaphragm to visualize both sides, and you can visualize the three layers of the one uh, uh, that's uh, in, from the opposition side or zone that's uh, plural uh, or brighter uh, layer and the, the 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 from the diaphragm uh, from the proteinal area this is the the third layer and between this one the um, the, the crawl core, core of the diaphragm this is the third layer so it's very important to be visualized in this point to be easy to make good uh, uh, judgment for this one. If you, if you uh, assessment for this uh, measurement, if there is any change in the, in the thickness of the, the diaphragm during the uh, inspiration, that's meaning um, uh, increase the thickness, that's meaning this patient is good. There's not no paralysis for this one. So we have to calculate this is the, uh, the diaphragm thickness uh, fraction uh, difference between the inspiration and expiration uh, divided by the, uh, the, the um, uh, thickness of the inspiration. Uh, um, than 20 percent, this patient is most likely paralysis of this more than 30 is most likely is, is success to be weaning the patient from that uh, uh, ventilator and sens sensitivity is around 88 and specificity is around 71. Um, usually the diaphragm from the, the left side is this little bit thickness uh, than the right side. It can be followed, this is the video. You can see how the, the diaphragm will be changed. Breathing. You can see this is the diaphragm. This is the layer, you see, this is the layer of that diaphragm. This is one, two, three. It changed the thickness of this layer during the beating or in the inspiration, inspiration uh, phase. But in this video, second video, you can see that layer or that two layers, no change during the time of the breathing. So you can see no change of the during the breathing. 
So this most likely is the paralysis of the diaphragm. Approach or technique. Uh, diaphragmatic uh, excursion for this one is very important. Should be measured for uh, low frequency, not high frequency. The first one, high frequency. The, the excursion for this one of the diaphragm, you have to be measured by uh, high frequency, low frequency. So the transducers should be placed between the mid clavicular line, sorry, and, uh, and the anterior axillary line, directed medially uh, and uh, cranially and dorsally to be uh, uh, visualized. The diaphragm is approximately five centimeter from the IVC uh, foramen and make good measurement by the M mode from the point of the uh, maximal excursion of that baseline. If you, if you make this patient uh, um, normal breathing, you can see that uh, M mode, you can see the excursion is uh, around 1.5 to 2 centimeter, if you can speaking about adults. Uh, but a, a deep breath is approaching six centimeter uh, difference between the base. Uh, reference uh, number from the adult, normal value is uh, quite breathing 1.5 to two centimeter, deep breath six to seven centimeter and the patient is snapping position uh, face is 2.5 to three centimeter. Um, so what's the indicator uh, that going for that assessment for diaphragm is very important if the patient, you think a patient may be going a patient with the diaphragm paralysis, if the patient going for any uh, major trauma, you think there is any, some can be allowed to be identified the unilateral or bilateral diaphragm to be predict. This patient is not easy to be extubated from this one and you have to use a mode. Uh, or the patient uh, with the mechanical ventilation uh, to try to win the patient from the ventilator. If you patient the excursion for this one is 1.4 or 1.7 for the in the during the, the, the ventilation is, is difficult to be win the patient from the extubation. Also, a patient post surgery like uh, cholecystectomy or patient post and the failure is very high when you, um, um, if you're not measure, this is a diaphragmatic excursion before this one. Um, let's go to, excuse me. Uh, Hamid, uh, I think we are running out of What's time. What's the whole so message you have to take from my, my okay. presentation? You have to use the ultrasound okay. technology is as adjunct assessment and the airway, the inconvenient and the portable and non-invasive, uh, co-effective and very informative. Uh, usually is very helpful usually for the level of the medical school to be sure and to be familiar for the anatomy. Yeah, and you can see this is one aesthetic and dynamic uh, uh, anatomy for the air airway. Also, can be confirmed the endotracheal tube placement and localize the uh, crocothyroid membrane and in the emergency airway and focus the very standard uh, standard to be cared for patient. There is very, very significant potential for the uh, integration of this ultrasound technology in the future care of the airway assessment. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hamad. Uh, uh, Any questions? For this uh, very interesting and highlighting uh, uh, presentation. Can you hear me, Hamad? Hello, Hamad, can you hear me? Hamad? Dr. Hamad? Aywa, and I'm with you, but I don't know why I am. Uh, uh, Hamad, can you hear me? Hamad? And I can hear you, Hamad. I can't see that anything. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, yalla. I'm sorry. 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 I'm s
I will show you the WhatsApp, but the problem is that Someone asked about, can we use the ultrasound in the assessment of the retropharyngeal abscess? Yes, it can be. Yeah, depend on that probe you can use for this one. You can use that probe or some call this one a transvaginal probe. You can cover this one and by sterile technique, you can just, you can visualize by local anesthesia for that said mouth, you can visualize the retropharyngeal. Efficient product for the use of health care provider to serve their patient. Solid uh, repetition for working in top pharmaceutical and medical devices corporates such as Abbott, Visor, Wet, Novartis, and uh, currently uh, at uh, Verathon. Today, he, he will share some of his experience by demonstrating uh, the use of uh, glidoscope uh, and glidoscope uh, products. Dr. Uh, Khalid, you can start, please. تسمعني يا دكتور؟ هل الصوت واضح؟ لا يا اسمعك الصوت واضح نعم هل بتعطيني بس مجال افتح الكاميرا لو ينفع الاورجنايزرز يسووا الاكسس بعد اذنك؟ يس تفضل شباب لو تسمحوا بس تعطوني مجال افتح الكاميرا خلود خلود كان خلود كان يو هيلب اس بليز تو بي ابل تو سويتش اون ذا كاميرا بليز شكرا لك دكتور مشكور دكتور هم السلام uh, عليكم uh, hi everyone uh, I would like to welcome you to the Glidescope demonstration session uh, first I would like to um, present myself I'm Khalid Ibrahim uh, the business development manager uh, at Verathon um, in the Middle East and uh, I would like to thank the committee uh, of this event uh, for being able to arrange and organize this uh, and uh, I'm delighted and honored to be uh, part of it, uh, of this magnificent program uh, alongside uh, very reputable uh, speakers who presented today uh, very insightful topics. And um, it's, it's definitely of a good beneficial use for all of us. Uh, today, uh, during this session, I'll present to you uh, our amazing uh, features and benefits of the Glidescope products. And uh, definitely we'll talk about that uh, have been recently uh, launched uh, in uh, the Middle East. And uh, I know that uh, some of you are watching us uh, in um, all over the world. Uh, and uh, th those experts in airway management, I'd like to thank them for being able to joining us today and uh, hopefully like we can this, have this event, uh, rep repetition of this event with a very clinical uh, sharing experience uh, all over the world. Uh, uh, product range and I'll share some tips and tricks about uh, how to use and uh, also uh, some information about uh, the, the features uh, in usage in um, routine and difficult airway management uh, using the Glidescope uh, range of products. So uh, let me start by presenting to you the Glidescope core. And this is uh, the Glidescope core who was uh, already launched in um, the Middle East. And uh, as you can see, uh, the monitor screen is uh, 15 inch uh, screen is a very big screen uh, to be able to allow uh, a better visualization of uh, airway uh, during uh, intubation. And uh, whether you do like uh, laryngoscopy 
uh, videoangioscopy or bronchoscopy, or uh, you have a multimodal uh, airway procedures, you might be able to use this type of, uh, you know, uh, as you know, like uh, initially we had a few years ago, uh, live scope monitor. It's a small screen, as you can see, versus the recently um, introduced uh, Glidescope Core 15. And um, you see like how much the size differ between uh, both products. So uh, at Verison, we put um, the user in mind and we made sure that we introduce products that can be very in the uh, ICU, in the NICU, in the ER, uh, all departments, we are uh, offering these type of products for uh, the purpose of serving patients and saving lives. And um, I, I heard a lot of very insightful type of uh, information today. And um, some, some of the topics we're mentioning about breathing and saving lives. And that's the purpose of all of us as experts, uh, uh, including yourself in airway management. is to help healthcare providers and uh, definitely, uh, you know, usage in, uh, in multi-purpose. So uh, we have also, in addition to the Glidescope um, uh, Monitor 15, we have also the Glidescope Core 10, just in case if you need uh, a smaller size. It depends on uh, you know, the preference, but definitely the Core 15 is a bigger screen that can be used inside uh, OT and uh, ER. To you, a portable screen where uh, we offer this as a Glidescope Go. And this uh, is also can be used uh, inside um, emergency departments. Uh, it's a very small handy type of product that can be used in, um, in crash carts and, um, and all uh, type of uh, ED procedures uh, for intubation. This comes with a different wide range of products. So as I said earlier, like the glass uh, um, airway visualization system that uh, provides you with a, a very, uh, helpful type of uh, features. So let's start by mentioning the, the benefits of the products that we have uh, different type of spectrum blades. And this blades, as you can see here, it's having a hyperangulated and uh, this uh, showing a 60 degree angle with a camera view of 30. And uh, we have different type of sizes. As you can see, this is a size 2.5. We have also similar angulation with a different size, uh, size uh, two and one and 2.5. And also for, this is all for pediatric. We also have same angulation, hyperangulated 60 degree for size three and four for adults. And also we have the mag blades where you can see here size three and four for those who prefer. These type of blades can all connect in addition to the Miller blades for neonates and pediatric. As you can see, this is a Miller blade and this can be used for uh, neonates and pediatric. We have size one and two. And all these type of uh, blades are disposable. We also happen to have a reusable type of blades. And this is a titanium. Uh, blade hyperangulated size two for pediatric, and also we have titanium blades in addition to the MAC blades. So we have almost um, around twenty type of blades, whether it's reusable and disposable. And uh, in addition to the spectrum and the titanium blades, we do have the GVL blades. Uh, so. All of this can be connected to a workstation. And as you can see here, it reduces the footprint because you can connect the bronchoscope and the videolangoscope to a dual view side by side where you can uh, visualize uh, the bronchoscope and the videolangoscope procedure together. So uh, this is a unique feature and benefit that uh, 
almost we can use for uh, most of the hospitals uh, that have uh, looking for an advanced type of technology. So whether you're performing a routine or a difficult airway procedure, this GlideScope can be very beneficial. You know, this is a good thing about also the workstation. Let me take you through it also. This monitor have an adjustable arm where you can rotate it and orient it so that we might be able to use it on the patient with your direct line of sight on the patient. That's a very beneficial, it's a crowd laser. Most of the uh, doctors found it really helpful that you don't need to, while you're, you're making intubation to the patient or you're doing any bronchoscopes. But, however, you might be able to shift that by having the monitor just above the patient chest. That's a very beneficial uh, tip. And in addition to that, we will do like um, a video endoscope. Let me do a quick demonstration on the pediatric and uh, uh, adult mannequin. We'll, we'll use uh, this uh, Miller blade on pediatric size zero. Intubation, as you can see here, I hope it's visual. Uh, so we, we saw earlier the four step technique where we use it on uh, uh, GlideScope and it's very helpful type of uh, tips where we might be able to do uh, uh, look into the mouth of the patient and drop the blade and then look at the, the screen. So might, you might be able to place it Epiglottis. Sometimes this, uh, this epiglottis is uh, floppy, so you might be able to lift the epiglottis with a blade, the Miller blade. And once you do that, you have a great view uh, of the larynx. So once you have this great view of the larynx, you might be able to get a malleable ET tube, style it or you might be able to use this, use rigid style. And this style is a disposable. It's uh, offered by a GlideScope, giving the right angulation also. So this is a great uh, beneficial tool. You might be able to include in, introduce it to the ET tube and don't make it protrude till the end, but just like make it adjustable through this rubber so that it can just like have this, the right shape. Put it in the right fledge of the tube and you might be able to look at the screen. So once you drop the ET tube inside, look at the screen and you can perform the intubation very easily. Once you put the ET tube and uh, just into the vocal cord, you might be able to lift the stylet and just like make sure to lift it in the curved front, not on the back side or up away. So once you do that, you just like lift the ET, the stylet and just drop the ET tube in, inside so that it can go through the vocal cord inside. So once you do that, it can be easily removed the stylet, the pediatric one. And you can definitely, once you finalize this, you can throw it in the dirty pin just on the right side of the workstation. So you can see here the dirty pin on the, on the left side here. So this is a panel where you can do put the tray, uh, prep tray, where you can do all the uh, blades ready for you to make the intubation later on. So this is a prep tray. This is the dirty pin. This is a straight up pin where you can take all the blades or the uh, accessories. So once you do that, just like remove the blade and you might be able to have the perfect intubation. You inflate the cuff and you might be able to have a proper one. The intubation 
becomes adult. So as you can see here, the, the curved or hyperangulated blade giving you the ability to connect easily. And you might be able to also to connect with a Bronx school. So let me connect both together to see the dual view. So here it goes, like this is a Bronx scope. And as you can see the Bronx scope, you might be able to have a easy connection. Magnetic, and you might be able to just like connect it easily like this. So once you hear this sound, that means it's connected. It's a single use Bronx. So uh, as you can see the B-Flex comes in three shapes. We offer this Bronx scope B-Flex in size 3.8, 5, and 5.8. That's a great addition to the GlideScope core monitor. Once you have this B-Flex, you might be able to do both monitor. It reduces also the footstep for having uh, many devices. Only one device, you might be having a dual view, the GlideScope, and the Bronxcope. So let me remove this and put the ET tube. And you might be able to see here. There is a retainer here. The ET tube retainer is very big. The ET tubes so that you cannot need or a tape or, or any type of accessory that might stick to the uh, Bronx scope. However, the ET retainer can be retained, the ET tube in a perfect condition. And as you can see here, like there's a working channel over here and there's a suction pump over there. And the control definitely will be from this side where the suction pump button will be from the other side. So once you place, once you place it inside, Once you place the blade inside, you can see here is the, the vallecula where I put already the blade and it's having the larynx in a best way shape. And once you place it inside, you might be able to use also the bronchoscope and you can do the bronchoscope along it. So as you can see here, I did Here, you might be able to lift and see also the larynx and you can visible, you see like the, the tip of the bronchoscope here. So you can easily drop it further. And once you drop it further, you might be able to have the perfect condition here where you find like the tracheal ring. So the tracheal ring here, you might be able to drop it further and see like inside, so you're already inside. So one, the video angoscope blade is done, good job. So once you're inside, you might be able to, if you don't want this, you have like the Magna view. The Magna view is having a very big, large visibility of the blades. You see here like the, the bronchoscope having a 50% extra view of the bronchoscope. So you might be able to have a very good visibility once you drop the, the bronc, the tracker ring and up till the Karina here. And you might be able to go left or side, get very good maneuverability, very good orientation here. that you can go easily drop till the end here, procule tree. So very good shape and you can easily adjust it based on your requirement. And you can see we're already almost there. So if you want to drop the ET tube, just like drop it from here and definitely remove the ET tube, the, sorry, the bronchoscope and keep the ET tube inside. That's actually like um, one of the features that um, very helpful during the intubation. And uh, there's a lot of products benefits also in addition to that. The good thing I want to mention here is that we have a bronchoscope here 
the label where we have 3.8, where you have like the ET tube from five and below, you can connect, sorry, five and above, you can connect to it. And you might be able to have also the, the 35 uh, French um, tube connected. In addition to the accessories where the, you have the forceps and the brush, you might be able to connect off below one millimeter. So all these features and, and the, you know, the benefits of the label that you can use on the bronch. So very good guidance. The, the label can be very helpful in identifying the requirements of the items that can be adjusted to it. So in addition to that, you see here, like you can buy any type of accessory of specimen trap disposable. You might be able to connect it to suction pump and definitely we, it will be very helpful during the section of, you know, certain type of uh, procedures can be, uh, you know, performed by this uh, type of tools. In addition to having the um, working channel down here, it's very helpful because some of the products having the working channel up, which gives a very loose, uh, you lose like a, around 15 centimeter of, um, you know, um, length where the item might be getting uh, jammed. So if you include um, a forceps or um, brush, it might get jammed during this procedure. However, having it down here as a working channel gives it very easy access and you save a lot of lens of uh, uh, the Bronx scope. In addition to that, you're having a neutral form of uh, the, the suction pump here. So suction port is just neutral in the middle. No need to have it on the side because some products have it in the side way on the right where you might not be able to have. So this is neutral way where you can connect to it easily and adjust to your uh, hospital settings. In addition to that, let me focus on also a very beneficial thing, which is the markers here. So it gives you like a, a, a very good guidance where you drop the Bronx school, as you can see here. So this is very good also guidance on where you are in the Bronx uh, inside the patient. In addition, share with you some uh, uh, very good information about our DLT double lumen tube stylet, where you might be able to purchase this uh, reusable double lumen tube for your use, in addition to a rigid stylet. This is a rigid stylet where you might be able to use it. And this is a disposable or a single use stylet. It gives you like the guidance, hyperangulated, uh, gives you a proper guidance where to use uh, um, the ET tube. And uh, without it, definitely malleable style will be definitely uh, difficult sometimes for certain cases. So this rigid style gives you a proper angulation for intubation. All these features are very important for the patient usage, uh, uh, for usage of, of healthcare providers in, in, in certain settings. In addition to that, I would like to screen having also an adjustable 180 degree rotation where you might be able to rotate the shape of, you might be able to rotate the, the screen just like 180 degree. So here, if you want to rotate 180 degree, it will be from this button. And back again, if you want to return it back to the normal position, standard one, you just a dual view. You go ahead with the same type of process. It gives you like the video angle scope and the wrong scope side by side. As I said earlier, dual view. If you want to shift to the magna view, just cancel one of these and just like keep it as a magna view. 
The good thing also is it, it, it can adapt, no need to have a wide balance issue because sometimes it gets blurred in certain type of devices. However, with the core system, it means that it have a technology where uh, no need to manually adjust the, the brightness of the light. It, it automatically performs this white balance and you can easily identify and have like a clear vision of uh, the, 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 the screen uh, of the trachea or the larynx or during the, the intubation or any pr pr procedure of the bronchoscope. So this is like all uh, very beneficial. In addition to the, the screenshots, you might be able to have inbuilt memory it's included uh, saved on the inbuilt uh, type of memory, which uh, gives you like a room of 100 gigabytes uh, in addition to also uh, filling notes where you might be able to put some notes during the procedure or after the procedure. And all this can be adjusted and saved inside the uh, core monitor. Once you do this, you might be able also to transfer the data through this USB, a media storage USB can be um, uh, in the back and you just like take all the information and shift it to your system. The laptop or, or internal system, you might be able to definitely use. In addition to that, you might be able also to connect this screen for learning and educational purpose. You might be able to use it and connect it to a bigger screen. Like for example, uh, let's connect an HDMI here where you might be able to connect to uh, this uh, system to so let's let's connect it together here takes a bit of yep all right so as you can see here like the bigger screen now is connected so that's for you know a certain type of educational purpose you might be able to also use that screen with the bronx scope and connect it as you can see here. So definitely a best you know, type of process might be conducted by having uh, very good screens like this. 15 will be very suitable inside OT and ICU and NICU and uh, emergency type of any department. All these beneficial products is very helpful. In addition to the working uh, station, where you might be able to adjust the screen just above the patient and uh, performing all the procedure successfully, whether it's a routine or a difficult type of intubation or a bronchoscopy. Thank you all for your time and joining uh, today. And uh, uh, it's almost midnight here in Dubai, but uh, I'm glad to be part and honored to be part of this program. Thank you and looking forward to meet you again in uh, other events. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Khaled, for this uh, informative information about your device, Lidoscope. I think it's been now recommended in most of the modern uh, emergency department because of its uh, easy use. And uh, we wish we will see conferences. Uh, your uh, presence had uh, a lot of value to our activity. Thank you so much and wish to see you again. And guys, uh, I think there is so many, so many questions, but because of the time restraint, uh, we can, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, as uh, Mr. Uh, Wael al uh, who is the general manager of uh, Mawsu'at al-Mustaqbal, he promised that all these presentation will be on uh, YouTube and uh, you can uh, communicate with for uh, the, the YouTube. Uh, for other questions, uh, like uh, whether the certificate, it will be sent to your email and it will be already uh, sent also to the uh, Mumaris, uh, the email of Mumaris that you have already uh, did. And it is five hours and you have to be uh, present uh, more than 70% of the time, like around two hours. And uh, uh, I would like also to announce uh, the very important announcement for uh, almost uh, end of this month, uh, infection control uh, course. This is uh, 30 hours. Uh, 
uh, it is also virtual through Mawsu'at al-Mustaqbal. And also we'll have our uh, pediatric emergency medicine course. It will be on 13 to 15 uh, uh, June uh, next month. And uh, I hope <coughs> uh, we'll see you there as it's uh, already on the screen. Okay, you can register through for pediatric emergency as it's written there 24 hours, see me hours with the Al-Hayya Saudiya, Littakhasasat al and also the infection control, patient safety 30 hours. Uh, hope uh, we will see you soon. And thank you to our uh, distinguished uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Salih Al-Shihri, Dr. Faiz Al-Harthi, Dr. Uh, Maher Al-Kuwaiti, uh, Dr. Uh, Hamad Al-Madi, and uh, uh, Dr. Muhammad Al Fafi, uh, Khalid Ibrahim. Thank you very much, all, and wish to see you soon, inshallah, in the next uh, uh, short time. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>